Spoilers ahead. Watch out, and take care. The movie begins with three guys in a jeep, talking about their boss, who is reputed to make five times more than his competition, due to his exceptional mastery of history. The nature of their work is not only unlawful, but also out of the ordinary. These people are referred to as black hunters. They excavate the bones of World War II soldiers, and sell the metals they uncover to collectors. Their supervisor, known as Borman, is currently completing a transaction with a wealthy individual, trading a large number of orders for a tidy sum. When the money is received, it is distributed to the gang, and Borman notifies them of where and when they must meet the next day. Borman is a truly tough guy, who can hold his own and deliver a brilliant quip when the occasion calls for it. He's a veritable compendium of World War II knowledge. Then there's Skull, a skinhead who favors military footwear, suspenders, and other such accoutrements. His major goal is to locate the Iron Cross, the Wehrmacht's highest medal. He may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but he more than makes up for it in muscle. The third member of the gang is Alcohol, a rap music fan, and mortal enemy of Skull, due to his hairstyle. Finally, there's Chukka, who is unimpressive in every aspect. The fellas set out on their excursion the next day. When they arrive at the excavation site, they discover that other players have encroached on their domain. Skull slams into the leader of the competitors without hesitation, and the rest of the boys join in. After defeating their adversaries, the squad gets to work. However, after a whole day of digging, they come up empty-handed. They decide to take a break for a snack, only to realize that much of the food has already been consumed. Borman dispatches the alcohol and one more to retrieve more provisions, informing him that he will not be paid for the day's work. Skull seizes this opportunity to exact vengeance on his buddy, sneaking out from camp and attacking alcohol, severing his dreadlocks. The troop returns to camp with food and vodka in hand, and the alcoholic presents himself to his colleagues with a new haircut. The others simply chuckle instead of reprimanding Skull. After eating, the crew continues their efforts, and soon comes across a sand-covered dugout. They discover six skeletons, a safe, a revolver, and an ancient wristwatch inside. They use this wristwatch to determine when the dugout was blown up. A nurse, an officer, and four troops were among those killed. Borman proceeds to pour through the documents, while the others amuse themselves, by shooting at the soldiers' heads. An elderly woman approaches them unexpectedly, mistaking them for the opposing side. She hands them a bucket of milk, and conveys her view that they are not plundering the remains, but rather attempting to properly bury them. She requests that they locate her son's cigarette case, which was misplaced in the area where he died. The group agrees mockingly to assist her in locating the case. But before she leaves, the insulted lady suggests they go swimming at the nearby lake. Borman discovers something strange, there are four military IDs in the safe, that belong to people with the same names as the group members, and appear identical to them. They conclude that they must have been poisoned by fake vodka, and go to the lake to refresh themselves. They jump into the warm water, and are abruptly thrust into the thick of battle, with bullets flying and bombs landing. They run in confusion after emerging from the water, absolutely naked. The enormity of the situation is not realized until they are arrested by Soviet soldiers. Soldiers misidentify them as deserters, and lead them to the camp. Borman, who is quick on his feet, advises Skull to cover up his swastika tattoo with mud, to avoid being shot in the head. He takes the instructions, and applies mud to the tattoo. Borman takes a risk, and confesses to the captain that they are ancestors from the future, a claim that is treated with suspicion and mockery. With a sneer, the captain asks him if they will win the war in the future, and he says that they will. When the captain orders their execution, a sympathetic sergeant intervenes, implying that they may be shell-shocked, and require medical attention. The captain agrees, and postpones the execution. They are clothed, and transported to the hospital unit. The next morning, as the group discusses their next move, an unexpected twist appears in the form of a lieutenant, who turns out to be Skull's neighbor, separated by 60 years in the chronology. They live on the same street and nearby houses, went to the same school, and even had the same boxing teacher, yet the lieutenant is young, and Skull is an old man. During the dialogue, Skull inadvertently mentions a television, and the troops around him have no idea what he is talking about. Borman saves the day by revealing that this is the name of a newspaper. However, their talk is cut short when air raid sirens sound, forcing the party to take cover. Bombs are all over the place, enemy jets are flying, and people are dying. Nurse Nina bravely attends to the injured, capturing Borman's attention. He professes his feelings for the nurse. But she pushes him away, telling him that now is not the time to get beneath her skirt. Ignoring this, he attempts to kiss her, 
for which he is promptly slapped across the face. Later that day, after the struggle, he visits her in the medical unit with flowers, and runs into Chukka at the entrance, who appears to have a crush on the nurse. Borman continues to flirt with Nina, but she still dismisses him. He persists in his pursuit, despite her rejections, even going so far as to divulge his secret of being from the future. Of course, she doesn't believe him, but she is intrigued by his stories. Meanwhile, the tourists spend the remainder of their time burying the mass graves. Alcohol quips that they were just digging up these graves, and now they're burying them, and Skull tells him to shut up. When the alcohol reminds him of his shaved head, Skull loses his cool and beats the jerk. When the sergeant notices the brawl, he intervenes to break it up. A concert reverberates around the camp late at night. Nina's lovely notes flood the air, joined by a nameless soldier's harp. Alcohol takes the stage with his guitar, and delivers a rowdy rock and roll set, stunning the soldiers, and even the captain, with the exception of one special officer, who is unimpressed. Borman notices his beloved Nina being dragged away by a lieutenant. He makes his way to her medical unit, hoping to steal a kiss, but his efforts are futile. Determined to get out of this hell hole, the heroes head for the lake, believing it to be a doorway back to their own time. But their attempts are futile, and they end up back in 1942. As they swim to land, the sergeant looks at them suspiciously, questioning their strange fascination with the lake. The heroes invent a lame reason, claiming that they swim in frigid water to harden themselves. Back at camp, the heroes are reduced to peeling potatoes, and strategizing about their next move. The old lady who had given them milk in the future suddenly appears. They implore her to send them back, but she doesn't understand them. They realize they've already ended their lives, because of a promise they made to find a cigarette case. They recall her son's name, Dmitry Sokolov. They discover that the man they are hunting for vanished on a mission, a week ago. Their fortunes change when they are summoned by an officer, who informs them that the lake they were swimming in was on enemy territory, and that they had accidentally crossed a minefield. The guys claim they were unaware of it. The officer, seeing their good fortune, offers them a mission, infiltrate enemy lines and capture a German soldier. The sergeant is designated as their leader. The officer takes their documents, and places them in the safe they discovered in the dugout a few days ago. Alcohol burst out laughing at the realization that the bodies discovered in the dugout belong to them. Borman checks the wristwatch they found, and discovers that they only have 62 hours to live, so he begins a countdown. The heroes set out on their objective, under cover of darkness, and succeed in apprehending a German officer, but their cover is compromised when they fail to gag him. The officer begins yelling, and the alarm goes off. Dodging gunshots, the heroes try to flee, but are rapidly besieged. In a last-ditch effort, the sergeant sacrifices himself to allow the heroes to flee. As they depart, the sergeant questions Borman about his belief that they will win the war. And, having learned of Triumph Day, the sergeant smiles, before storming into battle, taking out several Germans and succumbing to the enemy. The heroes successfully flee, but weariness soon overtakes them. Surrounded and captured, they are taken before a German colonel, whose memoirs Borman knows, and so, he tells the story of the colonel's life, who requests that they be left alone. Borman informs the German about Stalingrad, Berlin, and Hitler's suicide. The colonel is humiliated by Germany's defeat. They are brought to a barn after drinking vodka, and receive a pack of sausages from the colonel, where they discover another prisoner, Sokolov, who owns the cigarette case they require. Alcohol begins to argue with him, claiming that all of his deeds are total nonsense, because Hitler's admirers will be walking around Moscow in 60 years. This enrages the soldier, who knocks alcohol to the ground, and begins to choke him. After breaking up the brawl, the pals begin planning their escape. Sokolov explains that he created a tunnel, but was unable to evacuate, because of his broken legs. He requests that the heroes send his cigarette case to his mother, and they agree. Alcohol struggles to stop coughing as they exit the barn, having perhaps hurt his trachea in the battle with Sokolov. A guard approaches, alerted by the noise. When Sokolov notices this, he begins singing, buying them time to leave, despite the fact that Sokolov had been shot, the heroes return to the camp, keeping their capture a secret, in order to avoid needless questions. When the officer learns of the sergeant's death, he is enraged with their failure to protect their buddy and catch a German soldier. Nina meets Borman and kisses him, before taking him to the hayloft, after making sure he's okay. Chaka, who is in love with her, follows them. He becomes a witness to lovemaking after climbing a tree. He attacks Borman in a moment of rage. Nina flees, and the special officer witnesses the struggle, resulting in their incarceration in the basement. Nina requests that the special officer release them, but he is taken aback by her arrogance, and angrily sends her away. However, 
After speaking with the lieutenant, he decides to release the men. The lieutenant requests that Borman be held in detention, and only to be released before the battle tomorrow, because he is jealous of Nina. Meanwhile, the buddies disagree about how to proceed, and Skull insists on remaining with his pals, and fighting the next morning. However, Alcohol wishes to quit Borman and flee. Despite the conflict, Chucka refuses to do so. In frustration, Alcohol decides to walk to the lake alone. But Skull observes Borman possesses the cigarette case, which is required to return to the present. Borman is released right before the onslaught the next day, and they assess their alternatives. Escaping to the lake is almost certainly a death sentence from their own colleagues, who will most likely mistake them for enemy. Staying put is equally harmful. The only option is to engage in combat with everyone. Borman leads the charge into battle, followed by Skull. Chucka struggles for a long time to find his courage, but eventually joins the fight. Alcohol tries to retreat, but the second wave of attacks forces him back into the fight. Borman's leg is injured when a missile bursts near him. In panic, he slides down the funnel, attempting to stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, Skull and the lieutenant prepare to take out a machine gun pillbox from a nearby bunker. Having been on the mission before, Skull proposes outflanking it. The lieutenant hands him grenades, and orders him to blow up the pillbox. However, he refuses to blow it up on its own, calling it suicide. Chucka crawls into their hiding place. The lieutenant convinces the men that if the pillbox is not taken out, the offensive will collapse, and they will be killed by machine gun fire. Nina rushes to Borman, treating his wound, and then fleeing to help other wounded soldiers and promising to return shortly. Borman watches her bring a wounded officer into that blasted dugout from his concealment, and tries to call to her, but she doesn't hear him. Four fighters rush to her aid at the dugout, and they all go inside together. Borman looks at the stopwatch as she enters the dugout, terrified, when the last seconds pass, the dugout explodes. He finds his friends, and united with them, they storm the machine gun pillbox. Chucka was shot in the chest during the assault. The friends grab him and hurry to the lake. After diving in, they emerge uninjured in the 21st century present. Their belongings are still on the beach, and it feels like they were only gone for a few moments. Borman glances silently at a photo of Nina, as Skull removes the swastika tattoo from his hand with a sharp stone. When the heroes return to Moscow, they see a throng of skinheads, and prepare to teach them a lesson. The end, thank you for watching. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Turn on the notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out.